Our next speaker is um, our IT director, Donald Hester. Some of you may not have seen his face, but you probably have gotten an email from him. If your IT department does not return his information system questionnaire, he would be chasing after you. Don is um, a certified information system auditor. He has been with Maze for over 20 years. Um, he does not want to disclose how many years exactly he's here, but you can guess his age by just looking at him. His, his favorite movies are Forbidden Planets, which is a sci-fi movie, and all Star Wars movies. If he were not a IT director, he would have been either a teacher or a philosopher. Please help me welcome Don. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I think we have to ask Catherine what her favorite movie is, and what uh, and what would you be if you weren't uh, an accountant? It's not fair that all of us. Right. Be okay. So my favorite movie is You've Got Mail, which <laughs> is kind of like notebook-ish. Um, if I were not going to be an accountant, I would love to be in a, in a missionary. So that's what I would have done. Thank you. Now, I actually heard that she had a different favorite movie, but I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> she was embarrassed that it was Little Mermaid, and I thought, oh, why are you embarrassed? Now, there's a whole discussion before this that they said you can't pick Forbidden Planet as your favorite movie. Has anybody seen Forbidden Planet? One person. Come on, you guys. Leslie Nielsen, 1959, probably one of the best movies ever made. Now, especially for its time, it really held up pretty good. Um, but the reason why they didn't want to use it because it sounds like an adult film. <laughs> but I didn't think it did. I mean, if you see the real thing, but I don't know. Anyways. Watch your classical movies. Uh, so um, today I'm going to talk to you about IT controls and how they relate to you as a finance person, right? Because I've been listening to all this accounting stuff all day and I've been really bored and so now it's my turn to bore you guys. Uh, but it's not going to be as boring as you think because if you look at a lot of the statistics, finance people are in, involved in and have concerns with IT spending. Uh, the security and the internal controls as it relates to IT uh, for the financial environment. And so we'll talk about some of those things. Now, uh, how many of you process credit cards? Right, okay, so there's some controls you have to have in place, and if you don't have them in place and something happens, your city, district, agency, whatever, is on the hook for the losses of those uh, individuals uh, whose credit cards may have been compromised. So uh, there's things that you sort of have to do that Processing credit cards is a finance function, but IT does most of the work, right, as far as setting up the network and setting up the connections and all those types of things. Well, that's where all the security needs to be. So some of that stuff is what we'll, I'll talk about today. But in addition to today, I'm talking about the IT control environment in a way that you can understand it. I'm going to give you a concrete example of how this plays out and how it affects um, the finance department, right? Um, so I think last year I did something similar to this. As more and more stuff gets automated, I mean, we go back to you having an abacus and a big ledger sheet. We have some in the office from the 1920s. It's really cool. Uh, and you could go back and do your accounting that way. But as soon as you start putting stuff into the computers, you're relying upon controls that are now in the computers. So somewhere along the way, we started using it. And depending upon how automated that system is, in other words, how many checks and controls and how much is automated through the system depends upon how much of the IT control environment really covers the financial control environment. And that's why I have these two Zen diagrams here. Now, when I do my part of the audit, as Catherine says, and annoy people sending them emails saying, hey, where's my questionnaire? Um, I'm trying to find out what the risk of material misstatement is as it relates to the IT control environment. So is there something in IT that causes a problem that may make your financial statements have a misstatement or, or you lose money, a lot of money or something along those lines. I'm looking for the risk related to that. If, I, if the risk is high, then our auditors are gonna do more tr testing and, and that type of thing. So that's the purpose of the questionnaire and it's 
a statement on audit, audit standards 94, I think, that says that we need to get an insight into the control environment to see how it affects, and that's what we're looking for. Um, so it depends upon each individual environment how much, uh, how in depth it is, because it really depends upon how much it, how automated it is, really. Now, most people, uh, they'll test ins and outs and things like that, so we're not as concerned in those instances, because if $10 goes in and $10 is reported, then we've got, you know, and it's going to be a lot more than $10, sorry. I lost my ear thing. That's my bad. I move around too much, apparently. I'll tape it to my ear next time. Um, and Mark earlier today was talking about COSO. Uh, so COSO talks about having internal controls. COSO is not very helpful because it tells you at a very high level, you need to have enterprise-wide controls. And IT should be those things. But then they don't tell you how to do IT controls. And so you go to your IT folks, and your IT folks are like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right? You want internal controls. They don't, even, they don't use those terminology. Unless they're an IT auditor, and then, of course, we use those terminology all the time. So, and many of them don't perform risk assessments uh, either. So, uh, are your IT environments doing normal risk assessments so that they can assess and determine what the level of risk is uh, to your systems? Um, so, those are types of activities you, you can have. Now, the internal control guidelines from uh, the state controller's office comes out, and it says, hey, yes, you need to uh, look at your IT controls. But then again, how much uh, guidance do they give you? Like zero, right? So you're like, okay, what, what's the standard? What are we supposed to be doing? Um, and so if you look at it, IT governance as it, sorry, this thing just, my head's crooked or something. Uh, IT governance talks about a number of different objectives, uh, talking about determining what your objectives are. And the objective is, how much uptime do you want for your finance server? If you didn't have a, if it didn't work for a whole week, how, what kind of impact is that going to have on your, uh, your department? If you're not able to book journal entries, you're not able to print checks, you're not able to do anything, what is the impact to you? So you have objectives. You want to make sure that the system's available so that you can process and do your uh, finance processes. Did it fall off again? I don't even know where it went. <laughs> okay. I'm really bad at this. I'm not used to this. This is new. So anyways, uh, so you got to assess your risk. You look at what your risks are. You got to apply controls to limit those risks or mitigate those risks. And then on a regular basis, you need to assess those controls, see if those controls are working. Uh, and then in, in addition to that, you need to monitor the systems. Now, all of this process has already been defined by the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So if I do your audit, you're going to get a recommendation that says you should follow NIST because NIST already does it. It's recommended for state, local governments. The state of California has adopted NIST uh, for its standards uh, for doing it. Uh, and it covers the risk objectives that we're talking about here that the internal control guidelines uh, from the SEO comes out with, uh, talking about a, everything we just talked about, monitoring risk, uh, looking at uh, IT-related risk, being vigilant with it. One of the issues that you have with IT risk, though, is it changes rapidly. And that's one of the biggest problems that IT folks have, is trying to keep up to date with all the newest things. For example, I don't know how many of you got it, but the city of Sacramento had gotten a phishing attack, an email that said, hey, we need to get this, uh, and I think it just came out like this week or something and said, we need, uh, someone asked us to do uh, an ACH uh, payment transfer and it was fraudulent. Um, however, uh, one of our employees works for a nonprofit and they got the same type of email. So it's a fraud that's going out, they're sending emails trying to uh, solicit people to initiate a uh, ACH transfer. So they're trying to get money, you know, to make a bank transfer. Um, one of our staff members said, hey, uh, I can't just pay anything, I need an invoice. And guess what, they sent an invoice. So there's somebody on the other side who is paying attention, uh, some fraudster who's actually trying to get money from city. And so you are kind of being targeted by those types of things. Uh, this isn't exactly new, but this variant is a new thing, right? So it's a new attack vector that they're coming through. Um, not that email's not a new attack vector, they've been using it for a long time, but this new, uh, type of scheme that they're doing. I don't know if anybody, I just got a phone call the other day 
from someone saying that they're with the IRS telling me that they're going to take me into custody because I haven't paid my taxes. And I'm like, I work for an accounting firm. I know it doesn't work that way. If they're going to take me into custody, they're going to show up at the office with guns. <laughs> so, uh, but that didn't happen. I paid my taxes. <laughs> so, um, so eight, whoop, there it goes again. Hold on. You get tape from my head. Uh, applying control. So AICPA has auditing standards. Uh, they talk about control activities or the policies and procedures that help ensure uh, that management directives are carried out. Control activities, whether within IT or manual systems, have various objectives and are applied at various organizational functional levels. Now again, if I just tell you you got to do that, you're going to stand there and look at me like, I don't even know how to do that, right? And so your IT folks are going to do the exact same thing. They're going to be like, I don't, I don't know what that means. What, how do I do that? Well, for the most part, it means that you have to implement controls, industry standard controls, and so that's why there's industry standards in IT. You guys are familiar with GASB and FASB and, and SAS because you guys have standards. IT has standards too, right? Most IT folks don't necessarily know that they have standards. A lot of them do, but NIST has them. NIST recommends them. One of the things on the legal side of things is if doing your due diligence is when you follow what industry standard is. When you don't do it, you're not doing your due diligence. If you're not going to follow what this says, you have to have a risk-based reason for doing it. Like what's your risk-based reason for not implementing antivirus, right? So antivirus is a very common control. If you're not going to do it, why? Everybody else does it. Right, it's industry standard, right? So it's, and it's already defined by NIST. So you can go through NIST. The questionnaire that we use is based on the NIST questionnaire. So I tell all my clients, they say, well, how do I implement NIST? I gave you a questionnaire and asked you everything you gotta do. If you put no, do that. That's how you implement NIST, right? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of simple. Um, but risk has what, uh, NIST has what's called the risk management framework, and it looks very similar to what we just talked about, what COSO has and IT governance has. And basically is you have to categorize your system, select controls, implement controls, assess, authorize, and monitor. And so I'll go through each one of those just really quickly. First thing you have to do is you have to categorize your system. Like what kind of information do I have on your systems? Because you don't implement the same level of controls for all different types of data, right? If you have personally identifiable information, in other words, information with a person's name and their social security number or something like that, has to have more controls than uh, other types of data, right? Uh, you have a lot of data, and for most cities, well, it's all you know, public knowledge and all that stuff. But there's information within that that isn't, right? And so we have to protect those, that confidential information. So we have to categorize it so we know what we're dealing with. Um, but even if it's not confidential, integrity may be an important part of it. In, in financial aspects, integrity is probably the most important aspect of it. In other words, that it's accurate, right? Um, so when we talk about security, and I don't have a slide for this, but when we talk about cybersecurity, we don't talk about uh, just confidentiality. We talk about integrity and availability of the data. So integrity is what's really kind of important mostly for local governments because you have to be transparent and you have to have the right numbers, right? So integrity is important. Then you have to select controls. Well, NIST has all the controls selected for you. If you've after you determine what your level is uh, for your system, it has all the controls listed. It's really easy. If you have financial data and it's related to tax data, if you have uh, HR data, all the types of data that cities have, they're all moderate level. So there's a list of moderate level controls that IT implements. Guess what my questionnaire is based on? Same things, right? There you go. So select the controls now, you have to implement them. NIST has hundreds of documents that tell you how to implement things. So how do I implement antivirus? What's the appropriate way to do that? There's a whole document telling you how to do that. How do I implement a firewall? Whole document, how to do that. It's all industry standard, vetted, you know, Department of Homeland Security looked at it type of thing. Um, so it's all good information. Um, now important part is the federal government goes through the same process, but on a three year cycle, they have an audit of IT. You guys get audits every year, sorry. Uh, they only get it every three years. Um, the benefit is you as a non IT person, can verify that what IT says is true. That's the whole point of the audit, right? Uh, it's just like the whole point of a financial audit is you come up with a statement on what it is, auditors come and verify yes, what they say is accurate, right? So non 
accounting people can rely upon those reports. So for non-IT people to rely upon it, there's an audit process, and it's a, usually a three-year cycle, once every three years, right? And they're gonna look at the controls, assess the controls, and verify the controls are in place, working as intended, and function correctly, right? Now the authorizing part is a good part. The federal government st uh, struggles with this. I don't know why they do, but it's really simple this. Whoever the uh, business owner of the process that's related to the IT system, so let me give you an example, the finance server. It's a part of your business process. The authorizing part of this should not be IT, it should be finance. Why? Because IT doesn't know what your requirements are for you to get your job done with the systems that they have. How much downtime do you want? Let's say your finance server got wiped out and you had to recreate data because you know they lost the backups. How much do you want to do? You want to do one week, two weeks, a month's worth of input again? Zero. You want to do zero, right? Does IT know that? Yes. I, I hope they do, right? Because <laughs> if you want zero, they're going to have to, and it's going to be expensive, right? Because if you come to me as an IT person, you say, well, I want zero. I want, if it crashed today, I want it all back to you know, two seconds ago. I'm going to say, okay, the price tag for that's going to be this. And then you're going to be like, <laughs> okay, let's go back. How about a day? I say, well, it's this much. And they may go back to two days or something like that and say, okay, that's a reasonable price. Let's go with that, right? So there are costs you know, related to that. But the reason why we say that once the controls are in place, somebody should sign off on it, it's because the finance director typically would say, hey, the finance server, you put these controls in place, someone's audited it, and I'm okay with the level of risk related to that system. Not a good idea for IT to accept the risk. They don't know what's necessary for finance to do their job. They're not related to you. I mean, they don't know that, you know, you have to cut checks at a certain time of the month, you know, and then they say, oh, well, we we're gonna uh, upgrade the server. Well, do they tell you, hey, we need to do it on this day, and you say, oh, no, we can't do it on that day because we have payroll, right? We have to transmit, and we don't, we can't, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so it's a good idea that the stakeholder is involved in the process signs off on it, right? So, right? And then monitoring. Are these controls still in place? Are they working effectively and are they carrying on? So I'm gonna give you a scenario that's related to something happening recently. And uh, I'm sure you've heard about it because it's been in the news, but cybersecurity professionals, we've been tracking this for about a year and a half and it's growing like wildfire. So that's why I decided I'd bring it up this and apply what we just talked about controls and show you how it actually, uh, a couple of different controls can actually help prevent some of these types of things that are really big right now. And how many of you heard about ransomware recently? Right, it's been in the news. Uh, local governments are targeted, sorry, uh, because you guys are more likely to pay, right? Uh, so, <laughs> so that's what they're trying to do. So you'll get something like this that says, hey, your system has been compromised. And all they do is basically log into your system. They encrypt the whole entire thing and say, okay, you got your data, but you can't have it. If you want it, you're gonna have to pay us and then we'll give you the key so you can unlock it. So what do you end up doing? Hope that you have those backups and they're really good, <laughs> right? <laughs> that you have zero loss related to that? Well, and there's been stories, I should tell you one of them. So one police department got hit and it's the mid Midwest. And I'm not gonna make a joke about where they're from either. Uh, you'll get it as soon as I tell you what they did. Uh, they uh, got hit by ransomware. So they got the notification. So they said, well, we're not gonna pay it because you're asking for too much. We don't have that kind of money. So they said, okay, we have the backups. Let's recover the backups back onto the servers and get back up and running. They tried to recover it and it wasn't able to be recovered. But when they did the recovery, it deleted the files that were encrypted that were on the systems. So now those are gone. So they did the backup, put it back on the server, doesn't work. So then they call the uh, criminals up and said, okay, hey, uh, we're sorry, we'll pay it. So okay, pay it, give them the keys to it, and now the encrypted data is gone. So not only do they have nothing, but they also paid, <laughs> right? So, you know, I, I, I'm not even gonna say anything. All right, so <laughs> if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all, right? <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so this kind of gives you an idea what the ransomware is doing. Now, as a, a cybersecurity professional, one of the things we have to sort of kind of look at is think like criminals think. To, this, to them, this is a business. Who's going to pay more for the data that you have than you? Right? Because you need it to do your work. One of the reasons why they hit hospitals, they love to hit hospitals, is because integrity of the data is not as important. What's the most important aspect of the information that the hospital has? Well, privacy because there's a compliance issue. But really, you know, if Michael Jackson died from X, does it really stop operations? No. It's the availability, right? The availability of information. If I go in an emergency and I'm allergic to penicillin, that data has to be available to tell them I'm allergic to it. Otherwise, there's going to be a serious problem, right? So availability. How, what would happen if your, uh, your iron lung or whatever you're breathing through all of a sudden turned off? Now it's a life safety issue. So availability becomes really important. A privacy is a secondary concern, but that becomes the most important thing. They know that hospitals will pay because they can't have their systems not working. There's a life safety issue. So hospitals will pay, and they usually pay very quickly. That's what the criminals want. They just want to make money. So think about that. That's how they're going to make money, and that's, they, they run it like it's a business. So who are the typical folks that they target? They target everybody from individuals to corporations. So at, at this point in time, we've seen it kind of morph over the year, uh, over the last year, where they were targeting very specifically hospitals, and they were targeting very specifically um, local governments, transportation, education, colleges. They're notorious because they don't have a lot of controls in place. Uh, so it's very easy to infiltrate those systems. Um, so they're, they're areas that they do. But they hit everything. They hit hotels. They hit a hotel, and they actually set it up so that they locked out their key card system so nobody could get in or out of their rooms. So the hotel says, you know what? We're not going to pay it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to old-fashioned keys. So they went back to old-fashioned keys. Guess what the hackers did? They just encrypted their servers and said, well, you're still going to pay. So then they still ended up having to pay because their servers and all their data was gone. Right? So uh, the criminals, again, it's, it's, it's a business for them, and they're going to take any opportunity they can take to make money, and that's what they do. Uh, individuals, I got a story for you. I'll leave that to the end. Uh, so it, it, it hits close to home, and we've all heard about uh, this example, uh, transit agency getting hit, loss in revenue. So it was a big hit. It wasn't just the cost of the, uh, uh, the ransomware, but you had to have forensic experts come out and look at it and see what happened. You had to, IT had to spend a lot of money to replace and clean up those systems. Uh, in addition to that, there was lost revenues for the period of time that they were down. So this little tiny attack had a huge impact fiscally. Right? So this is the types of things that we're trying to... That if you implement the NIST controls, you're less likely to be hit with this. Right? It's not perfect. I have some staggering statistics. Out of Because what would you say? Most people would say, oh, just make sure you have antivirus installed and updated and all that stuff, and you'll be good to go. Out of everybody, the statistics that we see now, out of all the organizations that have been hit by ransomware, 86% of them had antivirus installed and running and they still got hit. Antivirus is not enough. It takes more than antivirus to do it. But if you don't have antivirus, your risk increases tenfold. So you have to think about it. It's not enough, but if you don't have it, you're, you're, you're a shoe in You're going to get it, right? So um, you want to do what you can to protect yourself. So, um, so let's take a look at this. Now, if Hackers broke into your system, and I've kind of like stratified this so that you can look at, hey, the city has a, a city or district. I'm sorry for all the districts out there, agencies. I just put city in there because most of them are cities. But city mission and finance have a mission. Whatever your mission is, whatever your goals are that you're trying to uh, accomplish, and you have processes that support that. And then those processes are supported by financial applications that might be on the local workstations and the financial server where the applications, uh, the server side of it resides. And then you have IT operations that kind of support all of that. Now, usually they're going to come in, however the hackers come in, they're going to come in here on the uh, IT operations side. They're going to come in somehow, whether it be through email or whether or not it comes through a, a, a link or a, a USB stick that they just drop in your parking lot. 
How many of you ever find like a USB stick or a CD in the parking lot? Did you put it into your computer? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> There's a, there's a TV show about uh, hackers, and that's one of the things they show. It's, it's an old trick. It's been around for a long time. You just take a, we used to, not we, but hackers used to take floppy disks back in the old days and just drop them in the, uh, a parking lot, or they take an AOL disk. Remember when you used to get those in the mail? All you old folks like me? Uh, the Catherine's talking about how old I am. Uh, so, um, and they would put uh, virus code on there so that they could uh, get your system. Right? So that's how they get into your system. They just go to your parking lot and drop off. Well, now it's gone from uh, disks to USB drives. Uh, or trying to get into your phone and then from your phone attack the uh, city system or the systems. So do your, are you, I don't know if you're, depending on what city you have, do you allow your uh, uh, end users, employees, or uh, people to get onto the wireless that's on your same network or is it a separate wireless network? when they have their cell phones, right? And that, is that another way in? Once they get in, then they can lock out your systems. And they can lock out the finance server and the finance uh, uh, workstations. Now, there you have a direct impact to the financial processes and the city meeting whatever its mission and objectives are. Because now we've grinded everything to a halt. So we either have to pay financial impact. Once you pay, you have to figure out how did they get in in the first place so we can correct it so it doesn't happen again. And your staff may not have the capability of doing it, so you may have to hire forensic experts to come in, determine how it happened so you can prevent it from not happening again because guess what will happen if you don't? You're going to get hit again because you're an easy mark. Do you think a criminal is going to go back to you? They, like repeat, they do like repeat customers. And there's some funny stuff about this because a lot of them, they even have help desk support. <laughs> they will help you buy bitcoins, show you how to do it so that you can pay them. And they'll do it very friendly because customer service, you know, they want to make sure. And I, I made a joke about it in one of my classes uh, uh, where I said that uh, uh, they should have like Yelp for criminals, right? So that you can know whether or not to pay them, right? <laughs> Do they have support? Because if I'm going to pay them, I want to make sure I have support. Um, so, and are they actually going to give me the keys? That was another question. Now, the good news for that is if you do pay them, which I don't recommend you do, but I can't tell you to or not do, um, but 86% of the time, they do give you the keys for you to recover your data. But that means that there's 14% of the time that it doesn't happen. And that's just the current statistics, right? So if you pay you're probably gonna get your stuff back. But you're an easy mark. People that have been hit once, how, what the percentage is about 36% get hit again. So again, if you got hit once, you wanna make sure that you spend the money to find out how it got in there to make sure it doesn't happen again. Uh, I don't know if you, well, I know a lot of people in the IT industry that are in cybersecurity, and I tell you right now, hospitals are so locked down People can't get to their own emails from, uh, you know, they can't get to Yahoo email, they can't do this, because basically all those systems uh, at all the hospitals, they lock everything out now. Employees are like, oh, this is crazy, I can't do anything. That's what they have to do to prevent this from happening. So the good news is there's a lot of IT cybersecurity professionals out there and they're working on these things. The bad thing is I used to be able to get to Facebook, I can't do it anymore. Sorry, I mean, really. <laughs> So what, what, what do you do if you get hit, right? So that's another question that always comes up. Uh, so first thing to do, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? You've heard that old saying. Is it a wives' tale or is that a, just an old saying? I don't know what you call it. Anyways, good advice. Uh, so uh, do you have backups? How often are the backups done? And are the backups separate from the network? Because guess what these guys are really smart at? If they can get into your system and lock it out, guess what they'll try and find? Your backups, and they will try to lock them out too. Because they found out that you don't pay if you do have backups, so they try to figure out what the backup system is. So when they get into your network, one of the first things they look for is all your servers and where all your data is. Then once the program figures all that stuff out, it says, okay, this is where all the servers are and here's all the databases. And it says, oh, by the way, this is the software that they're using for doing backups, and here's where they store the backups. So guess what they encrypt? All of it. 
Now you can't recover your backups. So great, you have your backups and you want 0% downtime, but it just got encrypted also. Right, so what are you gonna do about that? So you have to figure out how you're gonna make sure that. Uh, do risk assessments. Uh, here's my risk assessment for it. The risk assessment for ransomware is high. <laughs> All right, uh, that's just the way it is. It's been growing. It went from, uh, I think it was 2014, there was like four or five cases, 2015, a couple hundred. And I think this year to date, we're over thousands. I mean, it's like tens of thousands now. It's growing exponentially. Uh, it's, it's like a new market, right? And there, there's a lot of money you can make, like the California gold rush. Everybody's finding gold, so everybody came out here. And then all the gold was gone, and everybody kind of left. Well, right now, people are making money doing it, so they're doing it. Uh, making sure you make sure that systems are patched and that they're configured properly, that you're doing vulnerability scanning to kind of see if that's one of the things that we do as a part of our ISR. So we do a vulnerability scan, but we only do it externally. We don't do an internal one. Your systems, your IT folks should be looking at doing that regularly inside to see what weaknesses they have so that they can address them before they get hit. Good idea, right? Uh, know what the bad guys know before they know it. Uh, Whitelisting application, you can take this slide back to your IT folks and say, hey, can we do this stuff? So I don't, I don't have to explain each one of these things to you because some of this stuff you're gonna be like, I don't even know what whitelisting applications mean. You don't, just tell your IT folks that's one of the things they might wanna look into. Uh, one of the things that I do recommend though that's really important is uh, monitoring activity on the firewalls and things of that nature through email, uh, look for suspicious activity, uh, and then instant response. Most cities that I know of don't have a great instant response plan set up. Uh, we've, we've helped a couple cities help them develop at least a policy or review the policy that they had uh, that follows all the guidelines that you have. Uh, if you have, if you're a city, you may not have it if you're a district, but if you have a city and you have a police department and they have DOJ requirements uh, that they have, one of the requirements they have is the instant response. So they implement an instant response just for the Department of Justice. Well, what about the whole city? You have to have instant response. You should have some type of instant response. If you have credit cards, you should have an instant response plan because PCI says you're supposed to have that. So why have one for DOJ and then one for PCI? Why don't you just have one for the whole city, save yourself a lot of time, money, and effort, and just cover all the requirements in one document rather than 50 different documents? How are you gonna respond if something bad happens on the cyber side of things? Well, if it's the DOJ, then I gotta call them and tell them. If it's PCI, I gotta call the bank and tell them. And by the way, the bank, DOJ is not as bad. The banks are really bad because if you have an incident and you don't, you don't report it to them within 24 hours, they, they're gonna ding you for every day. You're gonna get a fine for every day that you haven't told them. It's like a $10,000 fine or something like that for every day that you don't tell them. So you want to tell them as soon as possible. They need to know as soon as possible so they can put out fraud alerts and cancel cards and do all that other type of thing. Um, and if you don't report it to them fast enough, then they're gonna charge you. In addition to charging you for everything else, the losses and all that other stuff. It can be expensive. I think uh, San Diego University had, uh, I think they got hit pretty bad and it was like $10,000 a month in fines for like six months uh, until they resolved the issue. Uh, and it's you either pay it or you don't process credit cards. So if you don't have a lot of credit cards, you probably say, well, we're gonna stop processing credit cards so we work this out because we don't wanna pay $10,000 a month. We don't even get $10,000 a month in revenue from it. Uh, one of the things that they recommend is that you either have a Bitcoin account set up so that you can fund it quickly and get it to do that, or that you have a third party have a Bitcoin uh, thing set up. Because the way they want you to pay is through Bitcoin, so it's not traceable, right? So they, they figured that much out. Uh, so that's the other thing that they said. So what do I find when I do audits that are some of the things that could help prevent this? Uh, one of the biggest things that I find, uh, password management is still a problem. Password management, there's all different aspects to password management. Not only is it just password management for your computer, but the, for the finance system. Um, if it's easily guessed passwords or the passwords aren't changed very often and somebody finds out uh, what they are, they can easily get into it. I've gone to some clients to on-site to see what's going on and I'll tell you one of them and I'm not gonna tell you what city it is because I'm not gonna out them. I was walking by outside, public area, walking by the IT director's office with a window that you could see in there. On the wall was a network diagram 
with usernames and passwords for all the different routers and switches in there. Now, obviously, that was an audit finding, right? Uh, so um, basically, anybody there you know, could have walked by there, saw that information, and I have the keys to your kingdom. I can get into your systems if I would have saw that. Uh, so password management is really important to that, hiding them. Uh, don't hide them underneath your keyboard, because that's where the first place I look uh, <laughs> if I'm there. Um, shared accounts. And everybody gets mad at me because I always say don't have shared accounts because they're like, well, the cash sharing program. Look, if you have no way, and it's not related necessarily to malware, but if you have no way of pointing to a, a particular employee and say that was the person that committed the fraud, if you have no way of doing that, then you can't hold them accountable for it. And if it's related to the cash sharing function, if you don't have an audit log, it, they're, 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 you're going to go to court and they're going to say, well, you can't, that's not admissible. You can't prove it was that person logged in at that time when that transaction happened. So you have to be able to prove that. And the only way to do that is if nobody shares passwords and nobody shares accounts. If I know his password and then he was doing something crazy or whatever online, whatever it was, and it goes down to court, they, he, he could say, well, Don knows his password. And that creates reasonable doubt. So now we don't know if he actually did or not. Now, if we had cameras in here and something like that, we saw that he was logged in at that time, that's a different story. We have to have something that's now a corroborating piece of evidence. But most of the time, we don't have that. So we just have them when they logged in, right? So, uh, so make sure that nobody shares accounts. Business continuity, this gets back to you know, your backups and can you do it? And are the backups separate so that they are not a part of the same disaster, whatever the disaster is? So I always say that. So if you have backups and you're in the Bay Area, do you have your backups off-site in case there's an earthquake? Because we haven't had one in a while. I'm just saying the risk keeps on going up every year that we don't have one, right? I mean, it, there's actuaries around here somewhere, right? I'm sure you can figure that out. Um, go to USGS website. It'll tell you how often <laughs> earthquakes are supposed to happen at what magnitude where, um, and we're due for one. So if something happens to you, are your backups off-site sufficiently so that you can recover operations in a reasonable period of time because your backups are not a part of City Hall having crashed or whatever it is, what, whatever happens. So what can you do with it? Now, that's one example. The other example is someone breaks in, encrypts all your data, is your backups not gonna be a part of that same disaster of everything being encrypted? Because if they get encrypted, then guess what? You're, you're, you're back to where you are. Uh, signing out and logging off, don't leave your computer logged in so people can walk by it, and patch and configuration management. You can talk to your IT folks about those things. But I always look at it this way. My job, and part of my job is, and I always wanted, I always did a support role. Everything I've ever done is kind of like a support role. It's kind of weird. But and maybe it's just my personality or whatever. I like helping people, and I like, you know, paying it forward or whatever, trying to make the, place a be uh, the world a better place, right? If I can stop some criminals because they can't get into your system, I feel like I've done a good job. I'm not saying I'm a hero or anything like that. Your IT people will be the heroes. Uh, but I get to help them do that, right? Everybody has a, a sidekick. Batman has Robin, right? I guess I have to be Robin in this case. Your, your, your IT guys see so it to be Batman, I'll be Robin. All right, so uh, the audit part is kind of helping them make sure that they have the right security for IT so that finance can do its mission, right? So it's kind of got stuck, so I'm kind of evaluating where they're at so that you know that they're kind of where they need to be. And if they're not where they need to be, they can fix it. They have a remediation plan. They have something they can do to fix it. So trying to support all the way up so that you can do your job. So you always hear that, I don't know if you always hear it, but on our letterhead and everything it says, we're in business to help you succeed. This is how we help you succeed. If you don't get hit, because my audit, I said you should have antivirus and you didn't have it, and then you don't get hit by malware, then I've helped you succeed, right? So I'm not a bad auditor. Are there bad auditors? I don't know. Well, some of them can be snotty, but I'm not that <laughs> kind. <laughs> I'm not that kind. I, had, I, had, I, had, I was doing some stuff for the federal government, and they said, oh, our auditors are coming in. We need, we, we're going to hire you because you can help us deal with the audit because you know what auditors are going to be looking for. Um, and then they were talking about all this stuff, and I said, okay, let's you, just be nice to your auditors because if, cause they can dig their heels in, and if they don't want to change something, they don't have to change anything, right? So just be reasonable with them and don't... And I'm not telling you not to 
make us upset or anything like that. But I was telling them, you know, if you just start a fight with them, the auditor's going to say, no, our finding stands or whatever it is. I said, then you're nowhere, right? So just reason with them. And if they're not reasonable, then get new auditors. <laughs> but I don't know how well that works, but uh, it's a federal government. Who cares what they do? Um, <laughs> So, uh, so part of this, I didn't really have to talk about this slide, but sometimes it's really important because um, one of the things that Mesa Associates gives you, and I'm not trying to do a sales pitch, but the slide's in here, so I'm doing it now. Um, and I know I'm standing between you and traffic or you and drinks or you and your family or, or you and going home and playing with pivot tables. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I did, you guys do that, right? <laughs> I go home and play with computer stuff. Uh, so, uh, but it's important that you have uh, individuals that understand what the process is. So a long 20 years ago, whatever it's been now, 18 years or whatever it is, May said, hey, you know something about IT, why don't you do it? Because our auditors don't really understand IT, and so we want you to do the audits uh, for the IT part of it. Well, and there's things out there that you should look for. If you have auditors that are going to do it, and not necessarily even us, if you're going to have IT audited as a whole or anything like that, you really should be looking for things that are certified information system auditors because they understand audit, and they understand controls, and they understand how to test. Now, there's a lot of other folks out there that have different IT certifications, and that doesn't necessarily mean they understand audits. It doesn't understand, they understand how to do controls or how to do auditing properly. Um, so it's important that you look for those types of people. In fact, uh, the GAO comes out and says, all right, if you're going to have someone do an IT audit for you, 65% of their staff should be certified information system auditors. And they don't really come out and say any certification is really necessary for anything, but they did on that instance make that. So that's one of the things that we obviously bring to you is we have a professional certification that does that. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to you for any questions. And I will preface this, you can ask me anything. Um, I may not be able to answer it, but if it's IT related, I probably can answer it. Any questions? Yes. Uh, why would an organization that leans to the left be a typical target? For oh, oh, yeah. So <laughs> why would one that leans to the left be a typical target? So uh, they actually, well, you, you know who's doing it. Some of them are coming from Russia. Some of the hackers are coming from Russia. And so part of it is one, business side of things. Who's going to pay? Uh, two, who has some dirt that doesn't want the dirt let out, right? And since that thing came out, because they, they, they were actually targeting left-leaning Democratic parties and all that stuff, and we think it was related because the Russians were behind it all, but since then they've changed it. They're, all, they're doing everybody now. So they're doing conservative-based parties, too, and, and stuff like that. Uh, but it was, I don't know why they picked the left first. I mean, if you're conservative, it's, well, of course, because the left people are all crooks. And if you're, <laughs> if you're on the left, and you're like, oh, they're just targeting us because they're, all, they're, they're in bed with the, bad guy, uh, the conservatives. So <laughs> I, I don't know. However you look at it, that, that's how they just started it. But now it's kind of like petered out. But here's the thing. Part of it is because some of that was probably, and I can't say for certain state-sponsored. In other words, another government was kind of funding it or directing it. But now, if you go into the dark web, uh, you can go down there and buy your own kit so you can start your own online business of ransomware. So you can start your own thing. They'll give you the code that's necessary that goes into the computer systems, that hacks it. And I think you can do it for one Bitcoin, which is, I don't know how much Bitcoin is now, 700 bucks or something like that. So 700 bucks is a good... Uh, franchise fee. I don't know what they want to call it, but they, they'll, they'll get you into the business if you want to get into the business for really cheap. And they'll, they even have help desk for that uh, to help you get into the business. So now it's not necessarily just state sponsored stuff or organized crime getting into it. It's the mom and pop shops now of criminals. Uh, it's just, it, if you can make money, someone's going to do it. Yes, sir. What are we doing to prevent this? What are we doing to prevent this? I, on a macro level? Um, so there's an organization that's out there that is, uh, that ha uh, Kaspersky is one of the main components of it, uh, but there's other uh, antivirus organizations that have get, uh, gotten together to reverse engineer the encryption to provide free keys to decrypt some of the uh, encryption that they've used. So, uh, but 
there used to be 20 variants to this. There's over a thousand now. And they probably only have unlocking keys or master keys for 30 of them. So they're working on all the other ones today. So if you get hit, so here's the thing. If you did get hit, one, verify that your data is actually encrypted. Because another, another organization got hit, got ransomware, they paid it, and their files weren't even encrypted. They just lied to them, <laughs> right? So, so verify it before you pay. Make sure that you actually have the problem, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, so they're working on those things. Uh, but again, they just keep on changing the algorithm that they use for the encryption, and it becomes more difficult to hit a moving target. So that's, they're working on it, but uh, again, NIST is like, okay, we have these controls. If you would implement these controls, your risk is way low compared to everybody else. Uh, but like I said, antivirus by itself is not enough. It won't, it won't protect you. Any other questions? You're all good then, right? Well then, I will, Catherine will do whatever to let you guys go so you can go home.